All right, well, welcome. Welcome to the inaugural Daniel F. Cracciolo Law Library Book Talk Series. I am Teresa Miguel Stearns, Associate Dean and Director of your Law Library. And this Book Talk Series will highlight books that our faculty, staff, and students publish during their time with us. I look forward to hosting these fun, educational, and interactive sessions in person come this fall. But in the meantime, I'm grateful that we can leverage technology and Zoom to allow us to come together today to celebrate and engage with Professor Sergio Puig on the occasion of the publication of his new book, At the Margins of Globalization, Indigenous Peoples and International Economic Law. What a perfect segue to sharing with you the University of Arizona's land acknowledgement. The University of Arizona sits on the original homelands of indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. Aligning with the university's core value of a diverse and inclusive community, it is an institutional responsibility to recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up the Wildcat community. At the institutional level, it is important to be proactive in broadening awareness throughout campus to ensure our students feel represented and valued. Professor Sergio Puig joined the University of Arizona King e. Rogers College of Law in 2014. He is a professor of law and director of the International Trade and Business Law Program. His academic interests include topics related to international economic law, international arbitration, law and society, network analysis, and law in the legal profession. Prior to joining Arizona Law, Professor Puig taught at Duke and Stanford Law Schools, where he was the Stanford Program in International Legal Studies Teaching Fellow. Professor Puig also worked for over three years in the Young Professionals Program for Lawyers and Scholars at the World Bank Group and ICSID, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. He has practiced law in leading law firms in Mexico City and Washington, DC. Professor Puig also co-founded TradeLab.org, an online community-based platform to facilitate legal assistance and services related to international trade and investment matters. Professor Puig is in conversation today about his new book with Professor and Dean, Dean through June 30th of this year, at the University of Colorado Law School, James Anaya. Dean Anaya served on the law faculty here at Arizona Law from 1999 to 2016 and at the University of Iowa from 1988 to 1999. Additionally, he has been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, the University of Toronto, and the University of Tulsa. Dean Anaya has taught and written extensively on international human rights and issues concerning indigenous peoples. Among his numerous publications are his acclaimed book, Indigenous Peoples and International Law, and his widely used textbook, International Human Rights, Problems of Law, Policy and Process. He served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2008 to 2014. Dean Anaya has also represented indigenous groups from many parts of North and Central America in landmark cases before domestic and international tribunals. Among his noteworthy activities, he participated in the drafting of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So Professors Puig and Anaya met here at the College of Law about two weeks ago to record their conversation about Professor Puig's new book. And we will have an opportunity now to eavesdrop on that conversation, which is about 20 minutes long. And then we'll come back together as we are right now for a live question and answer session with Professor Puig. I think the best way for Professor Puig to host the, 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 the Q&A is to create a queue using the raised hand feature, which you will find under the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will also monitor the chat and pull out any questions for Professor Puig from there. We will end the formal portion of this book talk at 1 p.m., but Professor Puig is happy to stay on until about 1.15 to discuss the book and his work. So please join me in welcoming and, create, and congratulating Professor Puig on the publication of his new book. And if we were live and in person, oh, there's a lot of hand claps. Terrific. All right. Hello, I'm really happy to be here with uh, Professor Sergio Puig, uh, who has just um, completed a book 
entitled At the Margins of Globalization, Indigenous Peoples and International Economic Law. Uh, Professor Puig, congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for being here in your house and uh, at this beautiful place in Arizona. And thank you for inspiring the, the book, because you really did. You inspired this book, and I'm very grateful that you had a chance to come to this presentation. Well, I'm really happy to be here in, 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 in uh, Tucson at the University of Arizona Law School. As you said, it's sort of my house. I spent many year, years here as a faculty member, so it's great being back and having this chance to talk to you about this, this wonderful project. Um, as you mentioned, I've done work on indigenous peoples, and I really enjoyed the conversations that we've had, I've, I've learned a lot from your insights. And I mean, you're, you come from this topic for, uh, as an expert on international economic law. Uh, that has really been your core subject. Uh, is that fair to say? And then you branched out in, into this, um, this intersection, I should say, with uh, indigenous people's rights. That's right. Uh, my, the, the core of the book is precisely that, right? Try to reach uh, the gap that I saw uh, between these two strands of scholarship. One uh, focus on the rights of indigenous peoples that comes from uh, business and uh, business and human rights. And then the, the, the more traditional rights of indigenous uh, peoples uh, mm -hmm. scholarship uh, that, you know, basically you being part on developing. And uh, the, the whole project, I think, have a little bit of a a seed, right? When we, uh, or I was, uh, I had a chance of travel with you uh, to different places where we were observing mm -hmm. processes of consultation involving business interests, right? Right. A, a, a process of consultation with indigenous people. Right. And and I, I invited you to come along because of your expertise on on business law in the international sphere. One of those projects that we looked at was in Costa Rica. Um, it had, well, it had to do with uh, consultation uh, regulation that was being developed in the context of business enterprises such as mining and other extractive and major projects. And then the other uh, project uh, was in Mexico and the Huchitan Peninsula had to do with a wind farm and it's, that was impacting indigenous people. So, so tell me about uh, how your interests in this book uh, relates to, to those two situations that, that we that we were able to, to share and examining. Absolutely, and thank you for the question. In fact, one of those, uh, it's a, a case study in, in the book, right? The, the case of uh, the windmills in uh, Huchitan. And in essence, what I perceive with this uh, exercise of consultation is that there was a need to understand better how business law and indigenous rights have to share this space, right? This, uh, this is and what are the limits of the rights of investors or what are the limits of the rights of uh, traders when are in the presence of uh, groups like indigenous peoples? And I, I found that there was very little written, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There was uh, barely any mention in the literature and I was very excited to, to try to take on this, um, this project, in part because um, I felt there was an opportunity to make a contribution, mm -hmm. right? To make a contribution in which you can actually say, well, these two different areas of law that sometimes seem too separate, right? The, the human rights of indigenous peoples and the, the rights of investors uh, are actually connected and connected in deep ways, right? right? And I think that that trip to Huchitan was yeah. the beginning of it, right? It, uh, right. Our consultation in, in Mexico. Right. So let's let's, let's dig down a, a little bit on this. So the rights of investors, right? Those are in investment treaties and that uh, imply obligations that governments have for uh, investor toward investors, right? right. Um, and then on the other hand, you have indigenous peoples who have rights that the government, uh, uh, at least in theory, is bound to to respect, and so. So, so tell us about how these these things, uh, these two areas intertwine in a case like Kuchitan. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely, I think, a key question in today's understanding of uh, both human rights law and uh, investment law, right? I think how these two areas or different areas of law actually uh, interact. I think in a case like this, I think governments should be aware that 
uh, while they have some commitments, as you will said, that are um, expressed in bilateral or international uh, economic agreements like bilateral investment treaties, they, that doesn't mean that they can uh, ignore the protections and the duties that they have towards indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the main question is how to harmonize and uh, adopt policies that while they conform with uh, their uh, obligations, they also do not breach the investment uh, treaties. Mm -hmm. And the main aspect that I would say here is that governments have a lot of policy space, right? To mm -hmm. act in accordance with uh, their um, treaty commitments under human rights law. So in other words, governments shouldn't use or shouldn't uh, believe right, that they are limited by the investment law treaties uh, to avoid taking on or avoid complying with their uh, commitments towards mm -hmm. indigenous peoples. So that is my main mm -hmm. message, perhaps, right? right? That they are yeah. actually governments uh, shouldn't be scared to right. uh, protect. Uh, but doesn't isn't there? Um, some would say there's a zero sum game here, though. Sometimes uh, government, if it's going to respect the rights of indigenous peoples over a particular territory, uh, that implies pulling back uh, on what companies might say is uh, uh, are there ob are the government's obligations towards the company to allow it to operate, say, a mine or an oil field, or in the case of Huichitan, a wind farm. Yeah, I mean that's. Um, that's one of the kind of tensions or the, the, the tensions that we will observe, right? So governments may um, see this as a zero sum, when in fact, I think most often is not uh, the case. I think what uh, groups that feel uh, marginalized or not taken into consideration, like indigenous peoples in this case, they don't, they don't want to be um, a burden or anything like that. They want to be Participate, participate on mm -hmm. on these projects, and I think like that was uh, uh, something that became clear to me uh, through this project. That uh, governments, I think, can do much better by integrating in the decision making mm -hmm. the indigenous authorities. Right. right? That basically this is um, an area where have um, well, this, this is this is an example where you know with a little bit of planning, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the desires and aspirations of indigenous peoples can be accommodated mm -hmm. in the decision-making process. And if that can be sorted out, I think they, mm -hmm. they, we start moving away from this zero-sum game. Right. right. Yeah, so often it seems that the, that the companies themselves see a zero-sum. Either they're going to be able to get their project done, uh, or if they have to respect indigenous rights, they're not going to be able to get their project done, right? That's right, and I and I think that is a, a, that's a mistake of the companies, right? Uh -huh. a, I think a, if they were better at engaging, you know, from from the outset with uh, a, authorities and both at the local, federal, and municipal levels, right? I think they can avoid much uh, right. of these uh, tensions. And and what's what's underneath? The, the resistance of companies. Sometimes you could say, well, it's just, you know, their economic calculus. But, you know, we came across a fellow called Centeno, you know, and what, what, what does someone like Centeno tell us about what, what's underneath a lot of the attitudes that, uh, that or the postures that, that companies take? Well, I think it's uh, ignorance at some level. I think also racism at that, another level. And mm -hmm. the other one is, I think, is lack of understanding uh, of uh, some of these places, right? right? They don't, some of the business leaders uh, they don't really have not spent a lot of time right. in areas where they actually do business right. or in areas where they have concessions. Right. And I think that's detrimental to their own benefit. And, uh, so they come up with a certain attitude towards indigenous peoples. They don't really necessarily see them as, as equals or capable of, of, of being real participants or, or partners in the project. Right. And I think that uh, is something that, or that type of 
attitude is across different sectors, right? I, I think that, you know, many, uh, I'm sure there's many businesses that do the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there's, uh, this is changing, but, but there's a, a, a level of arrogance where, uh, that I perceive in, in right. engaging in this uh, work that business knows better. And right. I, I think we, and that's part of the message as well, right? I think we will be wise to really try to learn from uh, mm -hmm. people who, who really have uh, been in the process of uh, taking care of some of these, the most pristine, pristine lines, right? For, for mm -hmm. example, the indigenous peoples, the indigenous who, are, peoples who are the right? ones who have, have lived there in the, these areas for centuries and for the centuries, have, yeah. have, have guarded it. So what, what would you say the, the, the main audience or who, who are the audiences for, for the book? Who are you trying to reach and, and what are you trying to say to these different audiences? If, if you could just encapsulate in a few words. So I guess there is maybe two different audiences. One is the audiences of Indian rights advocates, right? Um, who I think have not paid sufficient attention to the new possibilities of using different tools from different areas of international law to advance the interest of indigenous peoples. In this case, econo international economic law. International economic law, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and here there's some examples, right? Like the case of uh, the Inuit exception that uh, was successfully upheld at, um, at the World Trade Organization's appellate body, or some successes in, in different areas of international finance. And I think that it's something that we can, you know, or Indian advocates can rely more, right? Like engage with international economic organizations to advance the rights and interests of Indian peoples. At the same time, I think I wanted to make much more aware the um, scholars in my field that a way of understanding globalization without indigenous peoples, it's a way of understanding um, just part of globalization. We actually don't, we're not accustomed to see the negative effects. And one way of, uh, that we can actually zoom in into the negative effects of globalization is by seeing uh, the most vulnerable of our, mm -hmm. our um, members. Mm -hmm. uh, and sadly, and I think this is also uh, one of the messages of, the, of the, the book, that without really trying to understand the structural issues in our international economic frameworks, we won't be able to resolve the deep uh, distrust that we have mm -hmm. against international trade and economic law. Right. So it's really a, a book that tries to, to bridge different points of views and, and reconcile them away. You could say. Yeah, in a way, in a way, I think uh, it's it's hard to provide many solutions to the to the to the big questions that the mm. the, the book raises. I think one of uh, the main points that I'm trying to make here is uh, we need to adapt our international uh, economic agreements in a way that uh, we we put the the people most affected by globalization mm -hmm. first right. right now that to some extent can be a little bit naive mm -hmm. right because that ignores uh, the the deep um, structural issues that are at play but at least i think by mm -hmm. It, describing how they operate, mm. I think people with better yeah. ideas will come participate. And, and that's really the innovation of the book, isn't it? I mean, you have a vast literature and a lot of thinking and a lot of politics around uh, the global economy and all these bilateral, multilateral investment treaties and a lot of activity uh, around them. But the issues of indigenous peoples and human rights that you're addressing really are, are as, as the book says, they're, they're at the margins, right? And so that, that you're trying to bring them in from the margins. We are trying to uh, recenter, right, yeah. the yeah. the conversation in a in a way that brings the uh, indigenous peoples into the um, 
to the center of this conversation. And I think we are uh, at an interesting time, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, uh, we're facing you know, right now uh, a pandemic. We're facing also uh, this climate uh, calamity coming, right, right. Are already affecting us. And I think it's time to, to find solutions that can actually be um, not only sustainable, right, but also that address uh, the, the most vulnerable of us. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of what I, I want to, uh, that's how I want to move the conversation. Right. Yeah, right? And, with, and, and with these calamities, we, we many of us tend to just be so centered in our own world and what's around us, right? And and it's easy to to forget about the 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 out of sight and, and, and the people who are are not as not as well off. You and I were able to have this conversation because we've both been vaccinated, fully vaccinated. And right. so we're able to have a conversation without masks, but um, so many in other parts of the world aren't able to do that, including uh, indigenous peoples throughout the world. Absolutely, and I think the same has happened with the conversation around international trade, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, you know, with the vaccine, right? This vaccine mm -hmm. nationalism that you right. see, right? It's like we, you know, this is for us. We don't export anything. And you're right. I think like that is the, the reaction, right? That uh, with people or governments are in these uh, situations, right? That, you know, they, they face new challenges, the first uh, reaction is like, well, well, we'll address them and we have to take care of, you know, our uh, populations. But I, I, I think that it's uh, myopic, right? If, yeah. we, if we don't really uh, address, you know, basically from a more inclusive perspective, what all these issues that are actually interconnected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, and that's again is is a theme of the book, right? The these issues that are put to the margin, or people who are put placed at the margin, is really showing their centrality or putting them more towards the center and demonstrating the interconnectedness of the concerns that they have. So what what's next? I mean, you are a, a scholar, you're a professor, you dedicate yourself to scholarship and writing. Um, you're still relatively. <laughs> in the early stages of your career, I would say, from, from my standpoint at least, uh, although you're quite accomplished. Um, what's, uh, what's next? Well, thank you. Uh, well, I mean, uh, we were uh, chatting a little bit about this. I, I think that the challenges that um, Latin America faces in the next uh, few decades are immense, right? And mm -hmm. I think I, th I think I want to participate in, in those conversations and try to bring to the attention of American legal scholars the importance of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of these issues. I think for many years, Latin America has been seen as uh, this problematic region, at least from the perspective of uh, uh, the US. It's also, uh, you know, if anything, a footnote in mm -hmm. most <laughs> of right. the scholarly about legal issues, right? right? I mean, I think maybe with the exception of uh, uh, indigenous rights, right. Uh, right? That you you being a pioneer and uh, a force, but I think in most of uh, the literature in, in Latin America, doesn't really in, mm -hmm. in the law, the legal uh, literature doesn't appear very very much in it appears in right. the mar yeah. in, it, it appears in the margins. Right, right. So I think part of that is now kind of bringing attention of, of this type of So question. again I see a theme here looking at what's at the margins and trying to put more put it more in the center. Yes. <laughs> that's a, that's well 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 put right. Yeah. So now uh, do that with Latin American right. issues. Yeah. Well oh, great. Well congratulations again. Uh, the book is at the margins of globalization, indigenous peoples and international economic law. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Professor uh, Puig, and I wish you great success with the book. Well, thank you, and thank you for, for inspiring the book, and it's such an honor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
All right. Well, thank you, Professor Puig and Dina Naya. Um, and we've already got some questions in the queue. Professor Puig, I will silence myself and I'm going to just let you manage the queue at this point. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here. It really, it's an honor. And as you could see, I was a little bit overwhelmed by having a, a Jim and I uh, commenting or discussing the book. So sorry if I was a little bit nervous, but <laughs> it's understandable. Uh, so why don't we start with uh, maybe with Rebecca, who is also another force. <laughs> Hello, Sergio, and con huge congratulations on the publication of that amazing book. I look forward to reading it. Your discussion was wonderful with Dean and Naya. Um, I personally am very interested in the intersection of environment and then the controversy over development versus conservation. And obviously, that's a planetary discussion, but it's also embedded in um, President Biden's 30 by 30 plan. So, so we're thinking about indigenous lands and territories in relationship to development and capacity. And so much of the, um, the action in climate change and kind of analysis is in Latin America. So I'm, I'm just really curious about your thoughts about that nexus um, and, and then the status issues with indigenous peoples, like here, they do have forms of sovereignty that they can govern lands. Um, I'm not sure how that's working in the various Latin American countries, um, but with respect to development, that struck me as important. And I didn't, I didn't know the reference to the Inuit case that you and Dean and Naya were talking about, because I know that's another area of huge climate impact. Um, and will be transformative in the next um, decade or two. So again, these are questions I have. I, I look forward to reading the book, but any initial thoughts would be so welcome. Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. I think that is, I think, one of the main tensions that I see. And to be honest, this is, uh, uh, my, my thinking of this has evolved, right, a lot. I think when I started the, um, the, 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 the book project, or at least the, when we started doing the consultations, this is, I think, the first consultation that we had, uh, attended was in 2015. Uh, my thinking that was that basically indigenous advocates or indigenous communities and environmental um, interests were aligned. And it's often the case that they are not, right? Uh, for good reason. Right, so in many ways there is some reminiscence of an environmental movement, especially still prevalent in some as in parts of Latin America and other places, that is kind of um, very dismissive of the uh, preferences and sovereign rights of indigenous peoples. Right, like so. Oh yeah, we want this land to stay uh, pristine for our enjoyment, right? For our parks, for contributions, for our CO2, uh, you know, diminish, uh, diminishment, right? Or whatever is uh, the, the, the benefit that it can provide for, for other uh, all the, uh, people outside. I think what I, it was clear to me that um, the alignment of many indigenous communities wasn't there, right? Their beliefs, I mean, they, they really, what they wanted is to have a better, more control over their resources and uh, perhaps use them in ways that uh, benefit the communities. Uh, with a little bit of skepticism, of course, of these uh, tra traditional narratives of development. Um, so I think you're right. I think that is the tension and I think We'll see it as well with um, uh, even with a progressive administration like that is coming, uh, because you know it, it's going to take some time to address these questions. And I think you're right. I think uh, at least in in the U.S. with the the way that the tribal sovereignty works, I think there's much more power on the. Uh, on the communities. I think in Latin America, many of these issues are decided by very centralized authorities with very little um, knowledge of uh, the realities uh, in the local. Although this is also changing. And I think I was happily involved in the Constitutional uh, Commission in Mexico. And I think this is one of the areas where uh, authority has been transferred. And I think 
that can help navigate this, but this is going to take some time. So I, 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 I think you're pointing into the, the key issue for the next 30, 40 years of, um, I think, indigenous rights advocacy. Thank you. So maybe, uh, Christine. Thank you, Sergio. I can't wait to read this book like Rebecca. Big congratulations. This is really amazing. Um, today in my last human rights class, we actually talked about uh, businesses and human rights. Um, and for me, it's a fascinating subject. My, my um, uh, sort of case study for the students was looking at private military and security companies. And that industry, I think, has been successful with developing um, industry codes of a code of conduct and sort of an association with a platform for monitoring compliance and sanctioning businesses and such. And I'm wondering in your, um, in your book and sort of in your research, uh, if you have you know, similarly come across any successful industry codes of conduct or, um, and, and also just your opinion on those types of mechanisms um, to regulate a particular industry and, and how effective they might be in protecting human rights. Oh, well, thank you. That's um, a very good point. And, and I, you're right. I think there is some, some aspects where military contracting has been ahead of the curve, right, in many aspects. And I think, or, you know, at least they have the, the leverage of the federal government and this large contracting to implement safeguards. I think the, the 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 work of the World Bank has been also relatively good, although you know there is um, a, you know still a lot of things to do, right? That it could be done, and the way that it works basically is the inclusion of safeguards that are a part of these obligatory mechanisms that the, the World Bank has developed over time that get included in the lending uh, agreements with uh, the, um, the, the governments. And I think that has had some success. And then you, you see more industry specific uh, codes, right? Like, uh, so, you know, there's in the mining industry, there's starting to be much more codes that try to avert some of the main consequences of the, uh, the mining industry, but I mean, it, it, it's a, it's relative in terms of um, you know what uh, the, the size of the problem versus what they have accomplished. Uh, for supply chains, there's a model supply chains agreement that actually make the suppliers right much more uh, responsible for their practices at the at the domestic level, and you know responsibility can go down up right. And then I also was part of this group that designed the business and human rights arbitration rules, basically are expected to be included in different instruments. And they tend, they, the, the idea is that that can uh, actually help adjudicate and assign responsibility to corporations that do not follow uh, either these more contractual provisions or more public law in some instances as well. That will depend uh, in many instances of how widely adopted these rules are uh, uh, at the end, right? But you know, at least uh, it seems like there's a lot of interest, and some companies in some sectors are now including them in their in their contracts. So I, we can talk more on the side, and I can give you some hints. But uh, yeah, that's a um, terrific um, question. Thank you. Uh, maybe Samara, I can see you here. Well, I can see your hand. I cannot see you. <laughs> um, hi. So I, I know that everybody wants to hear from Samara, not me, but I'm um, actually the one who wants to ask the question. Um, and I, actually, I kind of want to ask two sort of related questions. So I can I can try to do that really quickly and then have you address both, maybe. But can, before that, can I ask you to identify yourself? <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Alan Dicker. I'm a second year student. Oh, nice. Thank you. Um, so I, I just I, I kind of wanted to go back to, to your conversation about whether this is sort of zero sum or not. And um, and the first thing I wanted to ask is just about sort of how you see um, situations where 
the issue is not so much sort of a consultation process that an indigenous community wants, but the ability to like withhold consent. Um, and, you know, how you, how you feel that like kind of the right to withhold consent um, is something that may need to sort of have its own uh, sort of legal framework, right? Or if that, you know, if that just is kind of rolled into a consultation process or not, um, particularly thinking about situations where some of these projects and everything are already like in fairly advanced development stages where people, you know, companies have already gotten licenses and things like that, which sort of puts, I think, indigenous communities a lot of times like on a very unequal playing field um, with these companies. Um, and the, and the second thing that I kind of just wanted to ask about um, is, you know, whether you sort of advocate um, in, in terms of, of these kind of international sort of economic agreements and frameworks um, in particular and sort of laws of general applicability, whether you advocate for an indigenous right to consultation in the creation of those mm. um, international laws and frameworks, because I think that that's another way that sort of indigenous communities go into the consultation process already on very unequal footing from these companies that have a lot of ability to influence those sort of general applicability laws. Yeah, well, thank you for both questions that uh, seem to be really well informed of the reality on the ground. And I, let me start with the second. Actually, the second question in some way was a little bit of the motivation of the, uh, of the book, right? Or was part of the motivation of the group. Uh, to what extent we should have um, a duty to consult international trade and investment agreements with indigenous peoples, right? And I think that was a key question that I, I was thinking in part because the special rapporteur was thinking about the, the past special rapporteur, eh, eh, Victoria, um, whose last name right now escaped me. Oh, that we, that, uh, sorry for, for missing her last name, but um, she actually did a report on the effects of trade and investment agreements. So part of my question was, well, should we require uh, the, uh, the, 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 the consultation on trade agreements. And then there was the position of the Inter-American Commission actually that said, you know, basically they be, they do, right? They, they require some. And my, my point is, I think it depends, right? It depends in, I, I, I think there is ways in which the, the negative impacts of trade agreements can be lessened and that, and that may, you know, help sort of which ones have to be, uh, you know, consulted and which ones are not going to be consulted. But th that's part where I, I discuss, it. I have a, a small section of the book where I discuss this question. Um, and I think it's a complicated one, right? But I think it's a motivating question of the, of the book. I think the second one, the first one, which I'm addressing second now, um, I think I, I, I wrote an article with uh, Professor Anaya on that topic. And I think the, you know, yeah, I think the duty to consult exists and it exists whether you include it or not in trade agreements. And I think, you know, governments have that duty to, 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 to consult when they, their decisions substantially affect indigenous peoples. Um, I think the, 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 the tribes, the indigenous peoples have the, the, the right to uh, withhold consent, right? And I think it's uh, completely the right and the decision. The question, I think, is what is the effect of withholding consent? And I think there's some debate here, right? And some advocates, and I don't think there are many people who advocate this. They say, well, that veto the project itself. Um, the position that I took with uh, Professor Naya is like, is, is, is different, right? That uh, 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 withholding consent doesn't veto a project. What basically is, um, it creates the, um, in, it creates a, a duty now of, of governments to uh, to ensure that there's no violations of human rights because like the the lack of consent or proceeding with a a, a process uh, 
uh, or a, um, proceeding with a, with a project without the consent is not per se a violation of human rights. But withhold, if the consent is withholding, then you know, the, kind of the presumption changes and governments can still you know, ensure that there's no actual violations, right? People not, don't get displaced, the lands don't get contaminated or then don't take it out, whatever a, a human rights violation you can imagine. And then governments can still uh, offer reparations and compensations if a violation exists. So I think like that's the way to, to, to think about the, the, um, the um, consultation process. Now, I barely touch that aspect in part because that I think deserves its own treatment separately. And then I have a, a, an article which reflects mostly the thinking of uh, Professor Anaya on that. But uh, thank you for, for, for that question. Um, Hey, Roy. Roy, you're muted. Okay, here I go. What theories of government or philosophies of government are most likely to lead to respect for indigenous rights? And is this a uniform uh, matter or does it vary? And you sometimes find more authoritarian governments actually protecting their local people? Well, I mean, I, I don't think I know enough to answer that question. I think that is a, a big question, but, but I, let me tell you a, a little bit of the big idea that the book has, right? I think the big idea that the book uh, has in my view is that basically the, um, the current model of globalization is also the result of uh, political and economic ideas, but sustained in an idea of a Western culture of individual choice. Or maybe, you know, it's just the illusion of individual choice, but with re limited responsibility for people and especially for corporations. I think this culture in turn it makes it very easy to ignore the way in which the systemic features of trade, investment, finance, and intellectual property agreements tend to marginalize different groups, which remain very vulnerable to the rapacious behavior by or that implicates, implicates commercial actors, very often with the involvement or tacit or implicit acceptance by governments. And I think while many of the legal mechanisms that underpin globalization have also adapted thanks to these pressures, right, by indigenous advocates and by the pressures, I think, of democratic governments, including uh, the US government, uh, you know, many indigenous peoples remain vulnerable and marginalized. Um, and this is because they're failing to sufficiently accommodate the indigenous interest or by accommodating them in a way that it's an afterthought, right? Mostly by creating exceptions that allow governments to create programs that support indigenous peoples, but not really forcing the um, states, right? The governments to take actions uh, and in a more active way. And this uh, has really been a, a misstep uh, by, by uh, governments and international organizations that have uh, not really uh, responding to the demands of change, to the own detriment, I have to say, of international uh, economic agreements, right? Think what's going on on the World Trade Organization and the pushback. And I think like it, one way of thinking ahead, right, is what could these institutions do better well, I think like they can learn from indigenous peoples, right? And uh, then to respect the distinct beliefs uh, about and forms of economic organizations, right? Like how uh, economic organizations happens in multiple different ways. They could have an active commitment uh, with self-determination. And, you know, again, right? More democratic governments have an, a more active commu co commi commitment with self-determination, including communal self-determination. And I think this is the key aspect that I think will uh, be the battle of the future, right? How to recognize individual and corporate duties uh, 
towards our planet uh, and future generations. And I think like this is the way that I try to think a little bit about this issue, right? Um, uh, that we need to rethink the way in which we include some of these ideas in trade agreements. Thank you. Professor Puig, I received a private chat um, question from a member of our audience. Um, and so here's the question. How should multinational corporations and jurisdictions or countries that do not recognize indigenous peoples and their rights enter into concessions on exploitation of natural resources in bilateral investment treaties? Well, bilateral investment treaties don't, don't work that way, right? What they do is basically create some protections for investors against expropriations, nationalizations, or unfair, unfair treatment by governments. Um, and then they have these corporations uh, remedy, right? That, which is a very controversial remedy, which is the right to sue a state, um, a government, right? Before an arbitration panel. I think the, I, I think the, the mining or corporations do not that do not recognize they, they you know that they don't recognize a tribal authority uh, maybe shouldn't be doing business <laughs> no <laughs> in that place right when there is right and I think it, it, it's often the case right that they conveniently ignore the the, the existence of a, a, a tribal population or tribal authorities in part because those concessions often in many instances are granted by the federal government, by a federal government, a centralized authority without, um, you know, any consultation or any engagement with the local population. I think for corporations, this opens, uh, you know, or increasingly opens with the changing in legal frameworks, uh, a lot of, um, liabilities and i think you know if i were the lawyers or if i was a lawyer for for this for a corporation i would say don't do it because this may create some liabilities for for a corporation and on top of this is this can re result in human rights violations um i hope this this uh, answers your question but i think you know um, it, it was a, a rather uh, complex question in that sense I, before I, you know, I mean, I'm happy to say until 11.15, but I noticed that it's almost one. And I want to uh, give a special thank to someone who is in the, or two people who are in the audience uh, that, you know, I've been, been very uh, supported by, by most of you, or, you know, if not all, but uh, Benedict, uh, um, who is uh, now, Doctor in law, who just recently defended his dissertation, was um, uh, almost a co-author of the, the book. He helped me doing uh, some of the edits and doing some of the research. So I want to thank him. And also uh, Andrew Shepherd, that I also saw that he was here. I don't know if he remains here. Or he went to to do one of his multiple tasks. Um, who uh, was also a, a you know, of tremendous help at the beginning of the of uh, the, the research of this project, he basically helped me digesting the complicated world of uh, intellectual property and indigenous rights. So I just wanted to say that before we finish and thank them uh, publicly for, for for their help and support the, the pro, uh, pro project. Um, thank you, Professor. and I'm happy to stay for for as long as there. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for attending. Um, this concludes the formal portion of our program. And as Professor Puig said, um, he'll stay on until 1.15 to answer any questions and to discuss his work. But many, many thanks to you, Professor Puig, and to Dean Anaya for coming uh, together to discuss your new book. Many congratulations on, on its publications. And on its publication and and thanks to everyone for attending today and I, I'm really looking forward to doing more of these book talks with our with our community um, in the fall when we're hopefully most of us are, are back together maybe even in person where we can gather in a classroom um, and, and share the, the amazing scholarship of our faculty our staff and our students as well so thank you all so much <laughs>